is a great story. To me, it's Easter story. Um, it was uh, written by Ken Davis, and he wrote, wrote about a woman, <clears throat> one of my favorites, about a woman who looked out of her window and saw her German shepherd shaking the life. Uh, do I have this? Am I on? I'm not on. Shaking the life out of the neighbor's rabbit. And her family already was not on good terms with these neighbors. And so she knew this was going to be a major disaster. And so she grabbed a broom and she beat on the dog until he dropped the now extremely dead rabbit out of his mouth. And then she panicked. She did not know what else to do, so she grabbed the rabbit, she took it inside, she gave it a bath, she blow-dried it to its original fluffiness, combed it until that rabbit was again looking pretty good, and then she snuck into the neighbor's yard and propped the rabbit back up in its cage. About an hour later, she heard screams coming from next door, and she asked her neighbor, what's going on? And the neighbor said, our rabbit, our rabbit. He died two weeks ago. We buried him, and now he's back. <laughs> There's a resurrection story for you. There's an Easter bunny story for you. It's not the one you expected, is it? So <clears throat> here's why I tell you that. There is purpose in that. As we read the story here this morning, what we need to see is just like today, people in the ancient world, they knew that dead rabbits will always stay dead. And they would scream if a rabbit came back to life. And in the same way, they knew that dead rabbis will always stay dead. Do you see how that matches kind of? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. A scholar by the name of N.T. Wright, he wrote this. A great scholar, especially around this time uh, of Jesus' time and around the resurrection, he said this. There were many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome as Jesus did. And then he said this a bit later. He said, in not one single case do we hear the slightest mention of the disappointed followers claiming their hero had been raised from the dead. They knew better. So as we read John's account of the resurrection of Jesus, we're going to see that Jesus' followers had absolutely no expectation that their rabbi was going to be raised up from the dead. His disciples had given up their careers, their livelihood, their lives revolved around Jesus. He was their friend. He was their savior, their king. And all of a sudden, Jesus seemed to just allow himself to be shamefully tried, beaten, crucified, it was chaos. A horrible mess. So we're going to read this story and see how this mess is transformed into a resurrection, not just for them, but for everyone, for every one of us. Now leading up to verse 10, where we begin reading Mary Magdalene, Peter and John have seen the stone rolled away. They found the tomb empty. And then it says, then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, <clears throat> one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So as our story develops, it all looks like there's nothing but suffering and defeat. People are shaking their heads wondering how God could bring anything good out of any of this, and then we see how the resurrection changes everything. There is this transition from chaos and despair into joy and renewal, and that kind of change still happens for us today. Every day as a pastor, I talk to people who are struggling in an endless number of ways. Some of you are angry. You've suffered some kind of hardship or injustice, and some <clears throat> of you are just sad, disappointed with life, and maybe it's your job, maybe it's your marriage, or uh, it's just people in your life, and for all of the chaos and disappointment of life, the Bible, and especially the New Testament, it drives home this theme of resurrection and newness. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul says, If anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And Jesus says in Revelation 21, verse 5, I am making all things new. So what this means is for all of us, underneath all of our struggles, we have a deep thirst for resurrection. And so you might be thinking something like, well, some time ago I, uh, I had this painful conversation with a family member, and it went something like this, if only I could take back these last years of my marriage and I could start over. Or maybe some of us are thinking, you know, if only I could take back what I said. Or if only I could somehow clear away the mess of my life and start fresh. Or if I, if I could go back to school and study this time. Or if I could only be skinny again. Or if I could dump the wrinkles or have my old face back. Or if I could have hair again, right? If I could only go back, right? You're thirsting for a newness. And when Jesus earlier said, I am the resurrection and the life, what he's saying is, I can do that. You want a fresh start? How about eternal newness? I can do it. And Jesus offers 
a new life that will turn your world upside down for the good forever. And he comes to all doubters, like some of us here today, and he says, it's not just that I was resurrected, I am the resurrection. I was dead, I now live, that's present tense, and my life can become your life. Paul said it in Romans this way, he said, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. And so listen, you will die to the old life, and now my new life and resurrection power can come into you. And our story in John chapter 20 makes this clear. His resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, is our resurrection through faith. If you look at the text, you will notice that Jesus starts giving gifts. And so, for example, he says, in verse 22, receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, he gives his peace, and, and they are bringing in the new. And the first gift that he provides his disciples for each one of us as well is faith. The founders of all world religions, Muhammad, Buddha, they're all still dead like the rabbit. And they can't do a thing for you today. But because of the resurrection, Jesus is alive, and he can give you faith. And that is the first and the primary gift. It is the means by which you know and receive all the other gifts. So this is why Jesus says to the Thomas, he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. He comes to Mary and the disciples, and he says, believe. And it's just as Paul recorded in Ephesians 2, verse 8, he says, faith is a gift of God. What this also means is that you are not able to muster up your own faith. Now think about this. Mary and his, all the disciples up till now had seen Jesus do countless spectacular miracles. One scholar said uh, that if you consider the population of Palestine at that time, it's possible that for three years, death, sickness, and disabilities were virtually eliminated from the nation. Mary had also seen Jesus raise people from the dead. And she heard Jesus claim that he would rise from the dead. In fact, the reason that they put a guard on the tomb was because even Jesus' enemies had heard about his claim that he would rise from the dead. And Mary also knew that Jesus had never said anything that, he hadn't, that hadn't come true. And yet her first response when she looks into the empty tomb is deep grief. They took the body. Everything is lost. Woe is me. My life is falling apart. And so if Mary and the disciples could not come up with faith under those conditions, there is not a one of us here that could come up with our own faith either. Amen? It's a gift. And so the question for all of us then is this. How do you get that faith? How do you get faith from the risen Christ? Well, there's three things we have to do when we look at the text. Number one, you have to go to him. You might think that's obvious, but there's a number of us here who have never done that. And maybe you haven't done it for a while. And what happens sometimes is that while you know that you're saved by faith in Christ, you hesitate to go to him because you don't think you have enough faith. Or you still have some doubts. And when you begin to think that your faith is weak, or I'm not worthy, what that means is that really you're turning your faith into something you must do. Something you have to earn for yourself. Some time ago, I had an elderly member here who was explaining to me his history with the church. And he said things like, well, you know, I just served in this way. And, I, and you know, I, I never really did that much. But the gospel which has transformed thousands and millions of people over the centuries, says 
that Jesus lived a perfect life on your behalf so that by receiving him as Savior, God can receive you and adopt you into his family on the basis of what Christ did, not on the basis of what you do. So I need to just talk for, to the young people here for a moment, <clears throat> just for a sec to get them caught up with history. It wasn't that long ago, it was about 10, 15 years ago, people enjoyed reading newspapers. Anybody remember newspapers? Yeah. <clears throat> I still have one neighbor, and I'm in a, kind of an elderly area who gets a newspaper on Sundays, I think it is. Yeah. So anyway, for you young people, this is a newspaper. And um, it's maybe not all as, 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 as exciting as it is for the guy on the right. But in the newspapers as well, there was always a comic section. And uh, it could be one page, two pages of comic strips. Some of you know by now that that was probably one of my favorite sections. And one of my favorite comic artists through the years was Johnny Hart. Anybody remember Johnny Hart? Raise your hand. Come on. All right, there's a few of you. Uh, he was the award-winning creator of The Wizard of Id and BC, which at one time reached 100 million readers a day. Isn't that something? He was raised in a moderately religious home, but it was never real serious, didn't really change his life until a Christian father and son installed a satellite dish in his home. And from then on, through a conversation with them, his faith started to come alive. And it started to show up in his comic strips, especially during the holidays. And he was especially profound with the teaching of the truth of the gospel at Easter. He died of a stroke, Johnny did, while working on his, at his drawing table on Holy Saturday exactly 17 years ago. And this is one of the strips that he left behind. I hate the term Good Friday. Why? Well, my Lord was hanged on a tree that day. Well, if you were going to be hanged on that day, and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? Good. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Here's what Johnny and the Gospel of John are telling us. The determining factor in your relationship to God is not your effort, but it is Christ's effort. It's not a matter of your past. It's not your record. It's Christ's record. Your past is past. Say this with me, would you? Jesus, come on now, Jesus is the doer for me, okay? It is, what? Finished. The suffering and death of Jesus has done it all for me. Faith is going to Jesus and saying, Lord, I know I have doubts, and I need your help even to believe. The minute you do that, You've believed. And you also need to understand it's not the amount of faith, but the object of your faith that saves you. I have a sister-in-law who's really afraid of flying. For weeks before her flight, she will talk about a recent plane crash. She'll focus on that and, and the many things that can go wrong. And so she gets on the plane. She's anxious. She's got fears and doubts. I think she uses a little bit of drugs. You didn't hear that from me. <clears throat> she hangs on tight to the armrest as the plane takes off, and at the same time, her husband, Phil, as he boards the plane with her, he's like Elmer Fudd whistling his way through the woods. Oblivious, laid back, relaxed, fully trusting in the plane and the crew to get the job done. And you know, every time they fly together, 
You know what happens? They both arrive safe and sound together. And when that happens, it wasn't the amount of faith that they had, but it was the object of their faith. It was the plane and the crew, right? That enabled them to arrive safely at their destination. And in the same way, you are to get on the plane with Jesus with whatever weak faith you have and say, I need your forgiveness. I need your help. I am helpless. Even my faith isn't good enough for salvation. And the minute you've gone to him, you have believed enough to be saved. So will you give up your own efforts, give up your excuses, and go to him? There's n there are no more excuses for avoiding him. Some of you here this morning have some things happening in your life that don't make any sense. There's some deep struggles. You're like Mary, standing in an empty tomb, and you're confused, and you're thinking it's all lost, but let's all go to him with whatever faith we have and trust that he's working through the mess and has everything under control. Lord, here are my doubts. Here are my fears. I trust in you to get me safely home. So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to come to him. The second is that we need to look at his wounds. And if you look at the text, you will notice that Jesus is constantly showing people his wounds. And he showed his wounds to Thomas, to the disciples. And the reason is, is that faith is not looking at your faith, but looking at Jesus. You might think about it this way. Faith is like a windshield. It's there to be looked through not at. If you focus and really keep staring at your windshield, what's going to happen? You're going to crash, right? You're going to crumple your car. If you look through your windshield, everything will be fine. If you look at your faith, your life will crumple. We look through faith to see Jesus' wounds. Faith is saying, my Lord, I see your wounds are enough for me. Because of your wounds, I can be healed and accepted. Isaiah 53, verse 5, by his wounds, we are what? Healed. As we gather here this morning, you, there are some who are struggling, maybe relating to a death or loss of health or loss of relationship, many other struggles. In the midst of those struggles that come our way, we need to believe that Jesus' resurrection is our resurrection. Jesus suffered and wept with us here on earth so that we can dance and laugh with him in heaven. And that joy begins as soon as you start to believe. You don't have to wait for heaven. It begins now. Amen? It does. And so we come with empty hands, believing that his wounds are enough to pay the price for our sin and guilt before a holy God. That's faith. Our life is built on the risen Christ. There is no politician in this election year, listen to me, there is no politician, no rising stock market, no real estate market that can save us. Amen? Only the risen Savior can do that. There is a newness and a hope that will carry us only when we look at his wounds. Philip Crosby, in his book, March Till They Die, told a story about a brutal forced march of American and European soldiers who had become prisoners during the Korean War. The POWs were forced to go sometimes 20 miles a day through, even though they were emaciated, hungry, suffering, and when the soldiers could no longer keep up and when they fell back, they were simply shot dead. And Philip Crosby and his friends, as they passed close to those GIs who were having a hard time keeping up, they would say slowly in a whisper so as not to be heard. They would come up alongside them and they would say, God is near us in this dark hour. His love is real. His mercy is real. His forgiveness is real. His reward is waiting for us. And in the same way, when you are beaten down, angry or discouraged, 
the resurrection and the love of Jesus will carry you. A third thing that we need to do in order to get faith from Christ is that you need to drop your conditions. <clears throat> faith is coming to Jesus and saying, I need you and I drop my conditions. So what does that mean? Well, notice how Thomas had all these different conditions. If I could put my hand in his side, if I could put my hand in his side, if I could put my finger in the nail prints, then I'll believe. If, 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 then I'll believe. And then when Jesus shows up, he says, stop doubting and believe. Get rid of your conditions, Thomas. Some of us have gone to Jesus. We've looked at his wounds, but we're still saying, I'll give myself to you if you'll give me this or that. Or I'll give myself to you if you can explain why that happened. Now think about this. Do you really want to bargain with Jesus? When Jesus says, look at my nail prints, I, what he's saying is, I gave myself utterly for you. So can you really look at Jesus' wounds and demand something more? Right? God rightly demands that we put our entire self on the altar as an offering to him. So what can you do, right, with someone who has given himself utterly for you except to give yourself utterly to him? There's no bargaining. There's no conditions to discuss. And, and you don't have to clean up your life first or wait until, wait until uh, you have enough faith. You go to him and you say, Lord, I'm helpless. I need your forgiveness. I, I even need faith. And then you accept that his wounds are enough and you give yourself totally to him. And at that point, you're in Christ, born again with his resurrection power at work in you. Now finally, how do you know that you have that faith? Well, you will live, number one, with purpose. If you look at verse 21, Jesus very quickly says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. You'll find that Jesus does that repeatedly as he engages people. God does that throughout Scripture. He's constantly sending his people. He calls us to get busy with bringing in his kingdom, just as we illustrate in our vision we pray that his kingdom will come, and we work toward his kingdom coming. The resurrection itself, it screams out that this world matters. You know all the chaos that you see in the news, and all of the wounds and the pain and the injustice. Some of you have suffered yourselves and is being suffered all around the world. And we are now employed to live out and share the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Again, N.T. Wright, he says this, Easter means that in a world where injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things and that we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement victory of Jesus over them all. This is our purpose. It's the reason we get up in the morning. We're raised to a new life to bring this new life to our neighbors, to our coworkers, our friends, our community, and the world. Think about how God's Spirit powerfully worked through a simple conversation between Johnny Hart, a comic creator, and a satellite installer. It can make all the difference in the world. One conversation. A second evidence that you have this faith is that you live with power. <clears throat> Verse 22, it says, The risen Lord Jesus said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the resurrection power that raised Jesus up from his burial into death. No rabbi, no rabbit, has ever been able to blast their way out of the grave to live for eternity. And now the that power is your power for newness and change. 
And so the way you could tell that you've met the risen Lord is that you see real changes and growth in your life. This is big. Are you making progress in love and joy? So everyone, I'll put you on the spot now. Look at your spouse or maybe someone uh, that's a friend. Look at them and say, am I less grumpy or irritable than last year? I may have caused some trouble here today, <laughs> right? Or how about this one? If I cause trouble for you, I have a pretty, pretty open week for counseling. <laughs> All right. Or how about this one? You can ask your spouse as well. Do I actively love and serve you more than a year ago? This really should be going on making progress in loving others well. And as well, what will happen is you don't care as much about what others think. And as well, you are selflessly sacrificing yourself more than last year. You're more peaceful. You're more joyful than you were last year. You could take criticism better than you can last year. You're very intentionally now discipling and building others up in their faith. And even as the chaos of the world seems to be escalating, don't watch so much news, but even as it is, your worry, your anxiety, your fear is de-escalating. And yes, you can ask your spouse or a friend or a family member, can you see a change in me? Right? Am I more patient and loving than last year? If you're struggling to make progress, today is the day to go to Jesus, see his wounds, and trust in his love and forgiveness for you, and it will change you. And finally, there's a third evidence of your faith. You have faith, and evidence is that you are living with peace. In verse 19, 21, 26, he's repeatedly saying to his his disciples, peace be with you. Every time the risen Christ appears to anybody, these are his first words, and here's why. The minute you know the risen Lord, you have beaten death. Amen? Author Peter Kreeft asks us to imagine the day When sin, death, and evil are finally defeated by Christ, he says, suppose God took you on a crystal ball trip into your future and you saw with indubitable certainty that despite everything, your sin, your smallness, your stupidity, you could have free for the asking your whole crazy heart's deepest desire, heaven, eternal joy, Would you not return fearless and singing? And he says, what can earth do to you if you are guaranteed heaven? To fear the worst earthly loss would be like a millionaire fearing the loss of a penny, less a scratch on a penny. Jesus can say peace to us because through the resurrection, the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is the best thing. Amen? It is. The worst thing, which is when you die, is now a dark door to the light. Nothing is fatal. Does that make a difference? Man, as a pastor, I have seen many people dying. And many people die. Some of them with Jesus. Some of them without. And it makes all the difference in the world. Not only that, but at the resurrection, Jesus is raised to the right hand of the Father. And he's in charge of history. And he's managing every last detail for you. The last line, or one of the lines of the hymn that we sang 
uh, at the beginning of the service, it says, ours the cross, the grave, the skies. And what that means, that is, if you know the resurrected king, the grave and the crosses are all yours. You can look straight into the eye of whatever comes your way and know that Jesus will raise you above it all. In Genesis, Joseph had been thrown down literally into a pit over and over. And whenever he prayed for a change, God didn't seem to do a thing. And, and after many ugly things that his brothers and others had done to him, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for what? For good. So I know that God is in control, and he will take all of the ugly struggles of all my life and turn them into good. Amen? Let's pray together. Holy Father, it's amazing what you provide through your resurrection. And we pray that every one of us would indeed go to you. We would look at your wounds. We would see and know the healing that you provide. We would drop our conditions. We would go with whatever weak faith we have. And we would know indeed what it means to live with purpose, to live with this great power and to live with peace. We pray for that for each one of us. We pray for that for our neighbors, for our friends, for our coworkers, for this community. Lord, we want to be a part of what you're doing to bring about your kingdom. You are worthy of our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.